I'm just preparing the live stream. And then Caleb, I'll send it out to you after so you can share it if you want or download it and do whatever you want with it. Sounds good. Okay. All right. All right, so we'll just let everyone in now. Here we go. So Sam, if you don't mind just keeping an eye on everybody to make sure if there's anyone else that shows up that they, they can let them in. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Hey everybody, it's Joe Bladick here. Thanks for joining us on this first time home buyer webinar. If I could just get all of you to mute your audio for now, and you don't have to share your video if you don't want to, but if you do, that's great. My name is Joe Bladick, and I'm joined here today by Sam Thompson and Caleb Streeter. And our goal today is, since you guys are all first-time home buyers, for you to leave here, leave our one-hour webinar feeling more confident wherever you are on your journey that you're ready to go on that next step, whatever that next step may be. So let me just bring up my screen for you and we can just get started. And nice. as we get going, if you have questions, so feel free. If you, if you had to sell or get a divorce or whatever and you haven't bought anything in a certain amount of time, you're not actually gonna reset it. So. All right, great. Thanks for that advice there. <laughs> so. If you can just all mute your uh, audio for now, I'll get started here. My name is Joe Bladek. Welcome to the first time home buyer webinar. We're aiming this webinar to be for folks in the Aurelia, Barrie and surrounding areas. So just a little bit of an agenda so we can give you an idea of what you can expect. My name is Joe Bladek. I'll be talking a little bit about the mortgages, pre-approvals, the importance of a pre-approval as well as your credit score, how to improve your credit score and what is uh, required to uh, get you a, a mortgage with a good credit score. We'll also be talking, uh, we'll move it on to Sam Thompson. He is a registered licensed mortgage agent. He'll be covering off some of the grants, the credits, and the rebates you can get when you buy your first home in Canada, as well as a new to Canada program, the first time home buyer incentive as well. And then Caleb Streeter, he is a real estate agent here in Aurelia, as well as in a uh, surrounding area. Uh, Barry Collingwood all over. He'll talk to you a little bit about his area, how he's been in real estate, his story, and how the home buying process works. And if you uh, haven't seen on the chat window there, we have a chance for you to win part of your down payment after this webinar is done. You'll be able to click on the link and fill in some information so you could receive a scratch card in the mail and then you'll be able to have a chance to possibly win your down payment from there. So a little bit about myself. I'll talk a little bit about how to get a mortgage, some top mortgage mistakes people make, how to get a mortgage, and how to improve your credit score. A little bit about me, just so you can have some personal information. My name is Joe. This is my family, my wife, Melissa, and my two kids. We live in Aurelia. We love it here. A uh, little bit about what I like to do for fun. I love to play music. Um, I love to play the drums specifically. And I've done some charity gigs in the past before my kids came along and I was more into that sort of thing. And I really still enjoy doing that as well. Um, and professionally, a little bit about myself there. 11 years now in the financial industry, I became a mortgage agent in 2010. And I've been in the top 10% of all mortgage brokers in Canada now. Uh, 2015 up till 2019 now and a little bit about why I became a mortgage broker I really love getting a good deal for myself whether that is them buying something like a car or even getting a mortgage for myself so I love to be able to pass that on to my clients as well as planning getting a mortgage it's really important to plan out the type of financing you need how it's going to match your financial goals in the future and your home ownership goals you wanna make sure that the financing is tailored to your needs. Also, you wanna make sure that you have the appropriate choices available. When you get a mortgage directly from a bank, um, you don't have that many mortgage choices available. But when you're dealing with the broker, you're dealing with all the banks and all the products. And sometimes there's a specific product that can be perfect for you. So I'll just launch into this quick example. 
their names are Jennifer and Joseph, and they're just like you perhaps today. Uh, they came to one of my seminars uh, in October of 2018. They only had $1,400 in the bank. They didn't even know their credit score and their total family income was $65,000. Why do I tell you this story? Well, I wanted to just tell you that it is possible for you to buy a home. Six months later, after they started with, uh, with me and my team and getting themselves pre-approved, getting their credit score worked on, they ended up moving into their home six months later, and we were able to secure a down payment for them from the county that they bought their home in as well. So all they had to do was essentially pay for the lawyer to close their file. Pretty amazing. So where do you start? First step is to get pre-approved. Before you do anything, before you call Caleb here to get you started on the home search, you want to get pre-approved. You don't want to be disappointed. You don't want to find that perfect home and, and Caleb finds that perfect home. It's $400,000 and you guys get it negotiated to $390,000, but then you find out the bank will only give you three eighty. dollars That will be really good information to know before you went to that home. Anyway, it also speeds up the process. It could get you uh, the final approval that much faster, presents a stronger offer, and also guarantees your rate. A lot of pre-approvals that we do are either good for 90 days or 120 days. And the best part about it is that once you're pre-approved and you don't buy a house in the first four months, it's really easy to get that reactivated. You don't have to go through the whole process again. You just simply send in a new pay stub and make sure you verify that that is still your current employer. And we can just increase that pre-approval for another 120 days. So if four months is not your window, maybe eight months is your window, you know, and that way you only have to do your pre-approval once and get it reactivated one more time. Here are some of the lenders I work with. You might know them. They might be your bank. Here's some more. The good thing about working with a broker is there are certain lenders that actually tailor their mortgages to first time home buyers. And some of them actually give you preferred um, benefits because you're a first time home buyer. So how do you get pre-approved? Well, it usually starts with a text message. So you're wondering, how do I do that? Well, you just text us. Hey, it's Joe and I'm looking to get pre-approved. And we take it from there. A lot of the times, the whole pre-approval process will be done over text message. And a lot of the times we'll maybe just set up a phone call or a video call. Sam and I are of, of making sure that your pre-approval is done quickly and efficiently. And if you don't like using the phone call app, you do not have to uh, give us a call at all. So what's required for a pre-approval? Simply a pay stub and your photo ID. You can send those documents via text. You can just text me a picture or you can um, email me a picture of your documents. Then after you get pre-approved, this is where the excitement kicks in. You get that certificate from our office and you're ready to go. And you know that you can afford a $450,000 home because we're able to squeeze a little bit extra out of your pre-approval by reorganizing a few debts. We get you off to Caleb and he'll start you on a search and getting you homes sent to your inbox. He'll talk a lot about that later, but essentially uh, he'll be able to help you find your home while you're not thinking about it. And then once he finds you that home, you'll have that pre-approval to present a strong and confident offer. So here's just an idea of what's available out there. I pulled this house off realtor.ca um, a few weeks ago now. Uh, Jack and Jill, I just put a, a fake couple together here. They make $75,000 combined income. This might be you guys. Uh, they also make an income of over $1,000 of Canada Child Benefit. And this is really key because a lot of lenders don't use Canada Child Benefit, but a lot of them do. So if we can align your mortgage with one of these lenders, we can get you a bigger mortgage at a really, really good low interest rate. These folks have 20 grand saved up and their debts are $400 a month in car loans and $100 a month in credit cards. Well, they can afford this home. The home is 409 and the down payment's $20,450. And a home like that would be 787 and 70 cents bi-weekly. Raise your hand if that's about the same as your rent payment or less. 
I want to see some hands. You can do that through the Zoom app. <laughs> no? All right, we got a couple. Awesome. So uh, why do Canadians use mortgage brokers? I love this photo because I'm a pretty tall guy. I'm about uh, six foot seven tall. And when I go to buy a shirt, I cannot find a shirt that fits me. I need a specialized shirt. Otherwise, I feel like I'm wearing the wrong shirt, no matter how good the salesman is. And I like to be able to use that as a guy to tell you that I want to make sure your mortgage fits what you're looking for. Um, if you have a unique story, for example, you might have a missed payment on your credit report. Well, there's certain lenders that we can explain the story to. Perhaps you had a missed payment because of a life situation or a breakup. We can explain that story and still get you pre-approved. Also, we only do one credit score check. So that way your credit score isn't hit 10 or 20 times by multiple lenders. It's just done once. And using a mortgage broker is free. We actually get you that mortgage and the lender pays us directly for doing that work for them. There's certain mortgages that you might want that may not be available through your bank, like maybe certain mortgages if you want to flip a home or portable mortgage if you want to keep your mortgage with you. Maybe you want to buy your first home with Caleb and live there only for one or two years and then use that equity to then get you your forever home. You never know. Also, in 2015, the Bank of Canada did a study and they found mortgage brokers save 0.15% versus the bank. So what does that work out to in money terms? That works out to $42.75 a month and almost a free Timmy's coffee every day. It's now a free Timmy's coffee every weekday of the month. Yeah, Caleb's got a Timmy's coffee and that's if you go to Timmy's anymore. If you're making your own coffee, you can buy yourself a lot of coffee, a lot of nice coffee. So a little bit about some of the mistakes that people make on their mortgage. And then um, just to let you know, don't forget to visit that link before the end of the webinar to fill in that information so you can get that scratch card in the mail so you can have a chance to win your down payment. And then after this, I'll pass it off to Sam. But what are the five biggest mistakes people make on their mortgage? All right, we got someone there. Okay, perfect. So mistake number one, ignoring your credit score. This is something that even I did when I was buying my first home. I didn't know what my credit score was. I was my first, I bought my first home when I was 23. And I was quite frankly, super scared about my credit score. And I didn't even know what would be on that. I had two OSAP loans, a couple credit cards. I still ended up getting approved, but it's good to know what's there and don't get stuck with a bad rate. And we can fix your credit. Sam and I can work on your credit to get it to the point where it needs to be to get that pre-approval. If you have no credit score, it's important that you uh, apply for a credit card right away. Having no credit score, the banks will simply look at you as the same as bad credit. And from that point, it'll take you about three to six months to get that credit score set up. If you have a good credit score, if you've been paying everything on time, even if you're carrying a balance, you probably have a really good credit score. If you have a past bankruptcy or consumer proposal, if you've gone through that before, in this case, you'll need to rebuild your credit. And if you're rebuilding your credit, you're going to need to rebuild it a little bit more than someone that hasn't gone through a consumer pro uh, proposal or bankruptcy before. And that is following the 222 rule where you'll need two credit cards for a minimum of two years after you've had a bankruptcy or a consumer proposal to get that mortgage approved. If you have questions about this, I'll be able to answer questions about this at the end of the presentation. All right, here's a little bit about what a good credit score is. Anything above a 630, we'll be able to get you financing. And the types of credit score. The two biggest things that will affect your credit score are the history and the debt owed. So the first thing I like to say is don't cancel any of your old credit cards because if you cancel any of your old credit cards, it will delete that good history off your credit bureau and now you're simply evaluated by your current credit history. So if you have old credit cards you've had since high school or college, put them away, just don't cancel them. Second is the debt owed. So a little bit of, I, I, I'm hoping for some interaction here. Can anyone tell me what is better is it better to have a $900 balance on a credit card with a $1,000 limit 
Or is it better to have a $900 balance on a credit card with a $10,000 limit? What is better for you? Anyone want to take a stab at this? Feel free to put it in the comments. All right. The second, second option. Yes, the second option is correct. So having a larger limit simply shows the bank that you're using a lower percentage of the overall limit. So 900 on 1,000 is 90% and 900 on 10,000 is 9%. So using 9% looks a lot better and that is what you're evaluated on. So always try to increase your limits and accept the limit increases when you're offered them. I know that seems strange and it probably seems something that you're not used to hearing, but that is actually how you can actually help your credit score. Make sure you review your options. And we talked about the difference between uh, a rate that is 2.84 and 2.99. That's a free Timmy's coffee almost every day. Or if you're looking at that savings over the life of your mortgage, it's $9,554.52, which pays for a nice hot tub, I would say. Hmm. All right, awesome. So next thing is... What about your payment options? Is it better to pay your mortgage bi-weekly or monthly? Can anyone answer that? Anyone in the chat? All right, got a couple. Bi-weekly, bi-weekly, bi-weekly. And that is correct. Everyone that is answering bi-weekly, it's correct. And I'll tell you why here. Your payment will be half your monthly payment, but it's essentially paying off your mortgage that much faster. You can see by the graph there. And in dollar terms, it works out, if you look at the bottom, choosing a bi-weekly payment, accelerated payment, saves $27,000 in interest and saves 2.4 years off your mortgage, which is fantastic. That's like a hot tub plus a sauna, maybe an outdoor pool in your backyard, or maybe you've saved enough money for a down payment on an investment property that Caleb can help you with. You never know, right? And don't borrow too much. Another mistake people make is they borrow too much. Maybe they'll buy the new car before they buy the new home. And in this case, it's really hard then to afford the new home that you really, really want. Make sure you don't buy a new car until after you've bought your home. And if you have, no worries. I can refinance your car loan to help you afford the mortgage. And we can talk about that later. Also, don't forget about closing costs. I'll make sure that we send out this uh, Canada's first time home buyer guide to all of you that attended the seminar via email later this week or next week. That way in here, you'll have the closing cost worksheet in here. So you'll be able to get that. And mistake number five, not getting pre-approved. Really, it's really quick, it's really easy. And um, the last mistake, this is a bonus mistake. I've added this one, I added this one today. Another mistake people make is they don't consider a cosigner. And it's really simple. All you have to do is ask. And I know that's really hard for a lot of people. It was really hard for me when I bought my first home. My dad actually co-signed on my first home. It was because I was a student. My income wasn't very verifiable. I understand. But we can do that temporarily. Say we got a temporary co-signer for two or three years. It can help you boost your affordability by 150000 That could be the difference between Caleb showing you a mobile home and an actual home which is going to make quite the difference because mobile homes don't really appreciate in value. Also, you can set up your temporary co-signer solution. So the responsibility falls 99% on you and 1% on the co-signer. And it gets you that home now. Some things you might want to consider is waiting until you pay off the debt, uh, until you pay off the debt. It could take one to two to three years. And by that point, the house may have increased in value in the same amount your debt would have been able to be paid off. So a lot of the times what people do is they get a co-signer and then two or three years later, they refinance their home, take off the co-signer and pay off their debt that was preventing them from having the co-signer. I mean, from preventing them from having no co-signer. I hope that makes sense to you. And in interest of time, I'll make sure that I wanna say that you guys get your home buyer team set up. That includes your mortgage broker, your buyer's agent, 
your home inspector, your insurance broker, and your real estate lawyer. And I'll leave you with this last example. Here's John and Jane, $75,000 total income as well. Same like the last couple, save $30,000. Uh, $250 in debts uh, for car loans, $100 a month OSAP, and $50, $50 a month in credit cards. Well, they were able to afford this home for $325,000 with a $16,250 down payment for $625 biweekly. So I would say that's pretty good. So don't forget to get pre-approved first. And now I'll pass it off to Sam. And Sam will start talking about the favorite part, um, which is some of the credits and grants you can get. All right. So I'll pass that off to Sam here. Perfect. Thanks, everybody, for listening. Thank you, Joe. That was, that was really good information. We got a good, good idea of, of what to expect, some mistakes to avoid. And as Joe said, now I'm going to get to the fun part. Uh, once I share my screen here of how to get some uh, money back when you're getting your mortgage, some grants that you can look to uh, apply for. And before I move on, um, I do just want to comment. Um, Joe, I think our link for the scratch cards wasn't working. So if you have a replacement uh, link so that people can sign up for that, again, don't forget to sign up once we put the new link on. Uh, it would be a great idea to... When you're down payment, get that extra 10 grand. Um, and again, if you have any questions, we don't expect you to remember everything through any of our presentations. So uh, if you have a question, just hold on to it, write it in the chat box. And then once we're all finished, we'll round off and cover anything that you guys still uh, needed a, a refresher on or any further detail. Alrighty, so let's get to the best part. So one of the first grants uh, that you guys can can look into or chat with us about is going to be um, a refund through Genworth um, of approximately $1,000 if you buy an energy efficient home. So if you're a first time buyer, uh, you can receive 10% of your CMHC insurance premium if you get an energy efficient home. So to see how that works out, uh, if you were to purchase a home for $425,000 with five down, that's a refund of about $1,100. Uh, $1 Again, there are um, uh, qualifications for this as well. If you do buy a resale home and you improve its energy efficiency by about 5%. Uh, the land transfer tax rebate. So if you are a first time home buyer, um, you can apply for this rebate to get approximately $4,000 back if you buy in Ontario. Um, if you're looking to buy in Toronto, they will add an additional $3,700 on that bringing the total rebate to 7,700. If you're not looking to buy in Toronto, you can expect a refund of about $4,000 in Ontario. So again, using our previous example on a $425,000 home, that works out to about $7,700. New to Canada benefits. So this one's really exciting. If you are new to Canada within the last five years and you have uh, you know permanent residency status, they actually have um, made the qualifications a bit easier um, if you're having difficulties, you know, getting a down payment, getting into that first home. So what they've done is they've reduced the employment requirements to only three months, as well as they don't actually look at a credit score. Um, you'll just have to provide them with some phone bills, insurance statements, and bank statements to, um, to become uh, approved for a mortgage. So there's also an HST rebate that's available. So if you're purchasing a new home from a builder or building one yourself, you can actually um, apply to have the HST um, rebate, which if your uh, new home was about $425,000, you can actually save up to $33,000. So again, it's a really good option if you're considering buying a new build or building one yourself um, to take advantage of this rebate. So there also is a tax credit available if you are a first time home buyer. So you would fill this out for your income tax um, and it's a, um, a tax credit of up to $5,000. So for a family, uh, if you had $85,000 as your household income, that can work out to about $2,100 right back into your pocket. Free one year home warranty. So this is available through some of our lenders. Um, and what it is, is they're offering one year, uh, a free home warranty on home heating, air conditioning, electrical, water heating, and plumbing. Murphy's Law, if anything goes wrong, it'll be in the first year of buying your home. So it's a great option to 
to ask us about if it's available for you and um, and take advantage of that warranty, which covers up to $10,000 in repairs with no inspection required. So guys, all of these things are, are readily available to almost all of you. So again, chatting with Joe and myself, we can really steer you into how to get the most money back, what grants you apply for. We save you time if you don't apply for, or sorry, you don't qualify for some of these. Um, just reach out to us. We can, we can walk you through this stuff. Um, you can also withdraw if you're having an issue uh, you know, with your down payment. You can withdraw from your RRSP completely tax-free. So they've increased it from $25,000 to $35,000 that each home buyer can withdraw, uh, about $50,000 per couple. And again, you would save in doing this about $21,000 just in tax if you have that kind of money saved up in your RRSP currently. So in order to qualify for this, again, you just have to be a first-time home buyer. A uh, person with a disability, either buying a home or a person with a disability. And if you're not a first time home buyer, but if you haven't owned any properties in the last four full calendar years, you will still qualify um, for this bonus. So now we're going to talk a little bit about the down payment process and how to get one if you don't already have one. So um, all of these municipalities here, um, they have a municipal um, housing grant or loan. Um, which works similar to the first time buying incentive, um, where through the municipality, they will cover um, usually five or 10% in a shared equity loan, but it is completely forgivable. So if you've purchased your home, you, you're, you're looking for your, your permanent home. Um, if you stay in the home for at least 20 years, then the loan is completely forgivable. You don't know anything back. That money just becomes yours. So if that's something you're interested in and um, you know, you're, Municipality is on the list here. It is available uh, for Simcoe County. Just let us know. We can get you. Um, we can get you applying for that as well. So in total, just looking at some of the things we've saved, uh, it could be a total savings of fifty-two thousand dollars. This is assuming, of course, that you apply for all or you know most of the above. Um, but again, all of these are readily available to everybody. We don't expect you to remember every single one I just went over. We know them uh, and that's, that's the benefit of, of working with us is we can really walk you through what ones you qualify for, what ones make sense for your situation. And of course, we'll walk you through the process of how to apply for a lot of those. So now we'll look at the first time home buying incentive. So get ready. So this one, um, so again, it enables first time home buyers to reduce your mortgage payment without increasing your down payment. Um, so what it is, is the, the government of Canada will give you, if it's a resale home, they will give you 5% down. If it is the purchase of a new construction, it's either 5% or 10% added to whatever amount that you want to put as a down payment. So let's just look at some figures here. So um, here's two examples of someone with the first time home buying incentive and a person who used the first time home buying incentive. So as you can see, their income was the same, home price is valued at the exact same, the down payment is the exact same, just the one on the right is using an additional 5% from the first time home buying incentive. So as you can see, it uh, reduces the mortgage uh, um, insurance premium by about you know, $5,000. Uh, the monthly mortgage repayment is uh, you know, $100 cheaper. So in monthly mortgage payments, it'll save you $123. And in yearly costs, that actually saves you $1,400. So if that's something that you'd like to take advantage of, it's a great program to save you on the life of your mortgage, all that money. Um, you can reach out to us. We can point you where to apply for that and walk you through the process of taking advantage of this incentive. So what properties are eligible? So, um, so any new construction or resale home, as I said, uh, duplex, triplex, fourplex, townhouses, condominiums, Basically, if Caleb can find it, more than likely it'll qualify for the incentive. So again, you're not really limited um, by what you can buy to use this incentive. So in order to apply, you do have to be a Canadian citizen, a uh, permanent resident, or if you're not a permanent resident, just be uh, legally authorized to work in Canada. They have set the maximum qualifying income of your household to uh, $120,000 and um, the maximum loan you can apply for will be four times what your household income is. 
And of course, at least one of the home buyers must be a first time home buyer. So that is the end of the, the grants uh, section of the presentation. So again, I'll plug it one more time. Um, as a thank you, we wanna get you guys signed up for a chance to win your down payment. Um, the link is in the chat box. I believe we have the new one in that is definitely working this time. Joe's giving me the thumbs up. Uh, so yeah, click the link, add your information in there. We'll get one sent out to you. Um, don't miss out on a chance to potentially win your down payment. So again, as Joe was saying, get pre-approved. Uh, you can call or text us at the office. Um, or again, by clicking the link, you can sign up for um, a callback that we can chat with you guys on the phone to, to get started in, in your mortgage. All right, so thank you for, for giving me the time for that. Uh, at this point, I'll, I'll kick it over to Caleb, who will run us through the real estate side and all of that important information that you need to know. Thanks, Sam. Thanks, Joe. Like, tons of great info. Uh, I learned a, I learned a lot myself, so that's good. It's too bad I'm not a first timer because those grants uh, sound pretty appealing. But uh, it's also appealing to help others and to be able to offer them savings they didn't know they qualified for. So hopefully, there's uh, there's been lots of value uh, given to people. Like I know I've gotten some here as well, and I'll be talking about these things in my meetings and presentations with first timers. So can everybody hear me okay and see the screen here? We're, we're good to go. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about myself and what the buying process looks like. And the reason why I wanted to start with that is because there, the buying process actually changes quite a bit every year. And I mean, you, you look for homes, you buy a home, that's kind of the common theme, but how you do it, and especially right now during this pandemic, um, we've gone pretty much virtual and pretty digital. There's still some in-person showings and meetings and home inspections, of course, can't happen over FaceTime, but what does the buying process look like in 2020? And if you're being given advice from your parents or a friend and they haven't purchased a home in the last five years, there's a high likelihood that they're missing a step or they they haven't seen how we do it today in, in our digital world. So and that'll be part of the advice that I'll be passing along uh, as first time home buyers. We'll talk about some of the costs. There's some cross pollination here in terms of information. Um, so if I cover a topic that we've already gone over, I'll just I'll just skip it there. But if you want some clarity on it afterwards in the q and I'm happy to answer that for you. Uh, we'll look a little bit about how you can buy a home and what your options are for representation and some of the pitfalls and fallacies of our industry. This one's always probably the most fun topic to cover just because um, I guess what you see on HGTV isn't really what happens uh, in Aurelia, Ontario. And then lastly, I just, I just thought I'd toss this in here because there is some consideration to be put into whether you buy a home a municipal home in the city or if you're going to be out in the country in the boonies and what the differences are and how that can affect your lending too. So a little bit about myself. I, yes, as Joe mentioned, I work in Aurelia. I'm a full-time real estate agent at home. I'm happily married. I have three young boys that keep me very active. Uh, they also push me to work hard. So that's good too, that, uh, that motivation. I've been in sales essentially since I was 19 my whole life. So it's it's my passion and I've transitioned out of looking at sales like sales and I've, I've kind of transitioned into making it a service role, which has helped me not burn out and create longevity in this role. And I've learned that I love to serve. So in that, it's, it's a, a great spot for a salesperson to be because you're never really selling a house. That's on you to determine if you like it. My job is to offer you services. And so that's opening doors, lining up mortgage partners, lawyers, just education, all those types of things. Um, some of my past achievements, uh, June 1st this year will be my fourth full year in real estate entering into my fifth year in real estate. So not long by tenure, um, but I just sold my 275th home yesterday. And so by units sold, there's definitely some experience there. I'm feeling blessed for those numbers. Um, those numbers have landed me on the top 35 agents in the country of Canada two years in a row, um, under 35. And then all age groups have landed on the top 200 list three years in a row. Um, 
I was lucky enough to be on TV and I appeared on a couple episodes of Buyer's Boot Camp when I ran into Scott McGilvery in Orlando, Florida by complete fluke. And we got to talking and then next thing you know, we filmed two episodes, one in Barrie, one in Aurelia. And I got my 13 seconds of fame there, but it was a, it was a good eye opener and uh, <laughs> it was it built some credibility that people had heard about me in the past. So what does the buying process look like? We've gone through this. It is very simple and it, and it should be simple. And it all starts with that golden ticket, that pre-approval. That's what I call your license to shop. There's no sense looking at homes or guessing at price ranges based on a realtor.ca affordability calculator. It's not gonna take into account a number of items that are going to affect your pre-approval. So getting that number is absolutely crucial because it steers the ship for everything that we do afterwards. And real estate agents really like it when you have, when you come to the table with a pre-approval. Now, meeting an agent and talking about the process is not a bad thing but if you're going to look at 15 homes before you talk to the bank that is backwards that golden ticket is your pre-approval and that is what again we call your license to shop having that in place first means a number of different things but it, it really puts you in the driver's seat when you're presenting an offer um, even if you do include a condition of financing that's really just more so to to tie up some loose ends and maybe cmhc is involved and that's a different process so it's always good to have that condition. Uh, but if you haven't gone to the bank yet, you're not likely going to get your pre-approval in the three to five business days in a fast moving real estate market that, uh, that you've written in your offer. So number one, get pre-approved. Number two, now you have a dollar amount to work with. And once you've selected an agent, and that's a whole nother process, you can interview agents, you can ask questions, but assuming you know someone, like someone, trust someone, um, it, you can ask some, some questions in terms of what their buyer's process looks like. But once you are partnered with a buyer's agent, they can set up a search on the real estate board. The real estate board is what we see and how we look for homes as agents is slightly more robust than realtor.ca, but it is in fact the back end that feeds realtor.ca. So realtor.ca is simply a data fed website. You cannot edit it and it grabs over 20,000 local real estate boards across the country of Canada and it's good to look at because you know there are agents from toronto that will list homes in aurelia and there are agents in aurelia that list homes in toronto and you're not always going to see a home on their board um, so using the realtors auto search in conjunction with realtor.ca is hands down the best way to find inventory today you might drive by a sign here or there you might see it coming soon on an agent's website but 95% of inventory is found through this auto search. It, the major benefit is it's instantaneous. So as soon as a home lists, within 30 seconds, it's in your inbox. It takes about four hours for realtor.ca to update. So if the public looking for homes isn't partnered up with an agent that has an active auto search set up, you're gonna see that home four hours in advance of the public. That's a leading edge you have. That's a competitive advantage. You could book a showing before they even know it's available. When you find that dream home in that perfect house, that's when you call your agent and you ask for a showing. If it matches your criteria, it's within the limits of your pre-approval. It's time to go see uh, what your money can buy you. I do notice a lot of first timers, because they haven't been through the offer process yet, find out what your market list to sale ratio is. Now, I know this is a lot of info, and again, I can cover this in the Q&A, but list to sale ratio is what a home sells for in relation to its original asking price. So what that means is if a house lists for $400,000 and it sells for three ninety, dollars like Joe said, that's 90, That's 10%, excuse me, what's 10 grand of 400? Two and a half, right? So that's 97.5% of its asking price. So that list to sale ratio is 97.5%. Knowing the average list to sale ratio in your market is going to help steer you in the right direction when you make an offer because Aurelia's list to sale ratio is completely different than Toronto's, which is completely different than the Muskoka's. And if a house is listed for 400,000 and they're selling for average two to 3% under asking price, then maybe you can bump your search up to 405 or 410. 
it might be just north of where you're pre-approved for, but you can bring it into it. But looking anything above that two to 3% range or outside of the average list to sale ratio is just setting yourself up for disappointment, thinking that you could get it for less. It doesn't really always work that way. Listing agents um, have a lot of homework that go into how they price homes. And most of the inventory you're seeing is gonna be priced within shooting range in and around market value. There's not a lot of excessively listed homes unless you're into north of 5 million and you're on the water in the Muskokas. Then you just pick a number. All right, you found your house, it's time to write an offer. This is a process in itself. Um, writing that offer, there are standard conditions. There are lots of different ways that you can make your offer stand out without sacrificing price. And we can talk about that in a little bit. And then once your offer is accepted, the wrap up is simply going through the conditional period. It's doing your due diligence. It's calling around and getting insurance quotes. It's sending the paperwork to your lender, which can be done by your agent so that it's a hands-off process for you. And then making sure that the final pre-approval is in place, you get the green light to waive conditions. And once between the period of waiving all of your conditions and closing date, you have a couple of walkthroughs that you can choose to use to go see the home, to show friends and family. You can take measurements to get excited and buy furniture in advance or whatever the case is. But really the agent's duties really drop off at that point, unfortunately. And it's, uh, it's just a waiting game between then and closing, just finalizing some loose ends. So what are some tips and tricks that you can employ um, as your first time buying a house? Number one, Disregard the sorry, Joe. I wasn't sure if this would affect or not affect the mortgage brokers. I don't think it does. Um, and I wasn't sure if they were advocates for this or not, but paying your property taxes directly to the township or directly to the city outside of including it in your monthly mortgage payment has its advantages. They're not huge, but for example, the lender will, if you decide to pay your taxes through your mortgage company, they're going to have an account set aside in which they must have money in to then pay the installments to the city. So you're planting and, and putting money aside. And we don't always know the exact amount right down to the penny. So the mortgage company is going to want to make sure that there's more than enough in that account. Nine times out of 10, the way I see it is they're holding more than they need to. So it's not a huge excess, but it could be money that you could have in your bank account and not sitting somewhere that you have no idea what it's for. If the opposite happens and there's not enough money for an installment in that account, no problem. Your taxes will still be paid. The mortgage company is going to make up the difference and charge you interest. So you do not need to spend the money, organize it directly with the township or with the city, and you can save yourself a couple of bucks. Tip one. Tip two, use a buyer's agent. And the reason I say this is because it costs you absolutely nothing. If you said right now, Caleb, let's go buy a house. And it took three months of pre-approvals, showing properties, home inspections, all everything that goes into it, it doesn't cost you a dime. Now, of course, there's closing costs. There's a down payment. You'll need a deposit with your offer. There's a home inspection fee. So I don't mean it's cost free to you, but my service or a real estate agent service from the buying side is free to the buyer we're remunerated, we're reimbursed, and we're paid by the seller. The seller pays both the seller's agent and the buyer's agent. So when it does come time to sell, yeah, it can be expensive. Uh, but right now, if you don't have anything to sell and you're simply buying, it makes absolutely perfect sense to find yourself a rock star buyer's agent to represent you. And we're going to talk about representation here in two minutes. Qualifying for land transfer tax rebate. I'm going to call my experts here, Joe and Sam. I don't really know how this works, but I've done it a number of times. So it just slips my mind sometimes. But um, I believe if you have a co-signer that isn't a first time home buyer, but you have their title portion adjusted down to 1% on closing. So you're 99% title owner and they're 1% title owner. The percentage in which you can get a land transfer tax rebate it's either 50-50 or it's the 99%. Do you know the answer? So uh, that's a great question and it is 99%. Okay, that's what I thought. So basically, don't go in 50-50 with your mom. She doesn't, you don't want her owning 50% of your house anyways. Um, you probably are just moving out of her place. And so as much as it can be yours, you wanna do that. And then you can get a 99% uh, land transfer tax rebate. So the 1% is going to be minuscule. And for your mom helping you out, you can pay that. 
do not buy a car before you start shopping for a house. Joe touched on this. Um, the worst thing you could possibly do is actually get a pre-approval and then go out and buy a car because that's going to affect uh, the limit in which the lender is going to qualify you for. And if you're not cognizant of that and you put an offer in three weeks after you've taken delivery of your new car and you can't get financing, it's going to be quite disappointing. Just wait and, and don't change jobs in between getting your pre-approval and buying your house. You can get away with it between firming up on a property and closing, but it's still not advised. Stay where you're working. Right the hour. Yeah, just in time, I was like, what the hell is going on? Must be a busy place. Thanks, Can I mute? There we go. Yeah. Don't change jobs. Don't buy a car. Get into your house and then and then do whatever you want. Um, search tools. I mentioned it before. Get that auto search set up with the realtor. Use realtor.ca for the homes that aren't on their local board. And then uh, you want to maximize the amount of homes that you're able to see. So if you're part of a Facebook group or you can look at different websites from different agents and kind of uh, steal their coming soons, you can do some drive-bys. There are so many different ways. I don't want to get right into the weeds today, but when you sit down with your agent, there's about four or five different streams in which you can find houses. And that agent, if they're local, is going to have their ears to the ground. So for example, um, when you work for a brokerage, there's other agents in that brokerage. They meet normally once a week, um, Mondays, Tuesdays, and they talk about all the inventory that they have coming to market that's not yet listed. And we're sitting there with our notepads saying, Joe and Sam want to buy a house and they're looking for a two-story with three bedrooms under 400000 And then Sally says, great news, I have a two-story under 400000 coming to market. Do you have anybody interested? And so that happens more often than you think. We call those exclusive sales. And um, you would not have otherwise known about them had you not hired a buyer's agent. Okay. Next slide. Options for representation. So I know that, you know, a lot of people like to do things themselves. The number one reason to save money. There's no savings if you try and represent yourself as a home buyer. So hire a buyer's agent. Some people just go on realtor.ca, they find a house, they contact the agent listing that house, and then they have to spend the first 10 or 15 minutes qualifying themselves through that agent. Are you pre-approved? Where do you currently live? Do you have a house to sell? Are you a first timer? Is mom and dad gonna co-sign, blah, blah, blah. What are you looking for? Where are you looking? How soon are you looking to move? It's pretty boring. And if you had to do that for every time you wanted to see a house, or meet with an agent before you had to see the house, it can get quite cumbersome. Whereas with a buyer's agent, you can tell your story once and then you can hunt and you can let that agent book all your showings. You don't have to be on the hook to book your own showings and manage your own schedule and meeting different agents and things like that. The other thing is too, if you hire a buyer's agent, they're gonna to go to bat for you. They know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. They're excited to help you, to serve you. It's business for them. So they're gonna give it their everything. The listing agent doesn't know if you're serious or not. They're getting paid regardless because at one point or another, that house is likely to sell. So whether it's you or somebody else, they can be slightly more lazy. They're the listing agents. So the fallacies um, is if I buy with the listing agent, I'm going to get a better deal because they're double ending it. They're getting twice the commission. They're getting twice the fee. They can give me a little bit to get a better deal. That is not true. That benefits the seller. Remember, it's the seller paying the fees. So you may say, well, ultimately, if the seller is willing to discount his commission, then I can get the house for a better price because they will net the same amount. Yes, that's true. Unfortunately, it's not how the industry works. It's not how the seller's thinking when they're negotiating an offer. They're thinking, how much can I save? They want their agent to double end it so they can ask for a discount so that they can sell for the market value and and save commission. They're not thinking, I can't wait to pass my commission savings onto a buyer so that somebody out there can get a great deal. It just doesn't work like that. So <laughs> Joe, you're laughing. Um, I'm just trying to be honest and upfront. The reality is if you have a buyer's agent, nine times out of 10, 10 times out of 10, they're gonna go to bat for you. They're gonna negotiate a better deal for you. Um, remember they have a fee too that if something came right down to the wire that they can opt to toss in to help close the gap for you. And that's really truly where you're gonna see some savings. 
Um, the listing agent's job is to protect the seller and to sell the home for as close to asking price as possible. That's not the buyer's agent's job, but not to be confused with the buyer's agent's job is just going to go out there and get you the best deal possible on every single house. Um, our job is to get you the house. It's not necessarily to get you the lowest price, but our goal is to help you save as much as possible as well. The uh, second fallacy is right in line with making an offer. I see this all the time. It's never worked out. Um, in all 275 transactions, they've ultimately all operated within the same uh, scope of reason. So if a house is listed for 400,000 and your agent does their homework and says, this house is easily worth anywhere between 385 and 400, they've listed at the top end of the market value range, probably seeing if they can't maximize their resale value. Well, if you are trusting your agent and you've seen their homework, Instead of it's just a verbal conversation, they've shown you how they've arrived at their market analysis for the property that you want to offer on. It doesn't make any sense to start lower because it's just not going to happen. The homework that your buyer's agent does is the exact same homework that the listing agent did to price the house. So there's a high probability that that's where they're going to want to land and that's where they're going to want to see an offer and that's where they're going to sign back at if you don't come within that range. There are deals to be had. And we can look at homes that have been on the market for a long time, homes that don't appeal to a large group or pool of buyers. But for the general population and most of the listings out there, coming in 10, 15, 20% under asking, asking price, which is the list price of the home, it's just not advisable. You're going to insult the seller and there's a high probability that they'll sign back at asking price or flat out decline your offer. As a first timer, you want to add strength to your offer. And that's going to be through pre-approval, tight condition timeframes, um, not asking the seller for a lot in there or not asking for the, to keep their house furnished. And if the appliances aren't included for all the appliances and then coming in low, it's just not going to happen that way. There needs to be a little bit of give and take. And remember, the end goal is to acquire the property. Um, and so you do want to maybe see if you can get a good deal and you do want to leave yourself some negotiation room. Uh, but it's not going to happen if, if the two worlds are too far apart. Um, the last one's kind of fun for me because I hadn't ever thought of this until it was brought to my attention um, multiple times, especially today. Well, I'm going to wait for the market to crash before I buy. Why? You want to save money. Understandable. Here's, here's real statistics. May of 2017, the housing market dropped off big time. It happened in Toronto and it trickled north and it definitely hit us here in Aurelia. So if you look at the numbers though, the drop in price where the peak in April of 2017 down to May of 2017, the drop in price did not drop below the previous year's high. So year over year, pricing was still up. It was just down month over month. If you happened to wait one month and you had a crystal ball, you would have won. And that's really only the second time in history that, that that's happened, at least in our lifetimes. And this is based off a 50 year average. That 50 year average I pulled is for the city of Barrie and it shows an average of 5% year over year growth. So you may have had 18% growth like in 2016 and 17. You may have had a 20% decline like in the eighties, but overall, home prices have healthily increased by 5% year over year. So if you wait for the market to crash, you, you might be right. I definitely wouldn't be putting my stock in that, but you might be right. But it depends on how long you've waited. Because if you can buy today and the market continues to go up and it crashes and the prices are the same, so a house is 400,000 today and you can afford it, but you wait and it goes down to 375, um, it doesn't really matter and then it might go back up because you're you're losing out on all that time of market equity and then any sort of potential inflation, which is much more probable than deflation, uh, you're also losing out on. So um, waiting for the market to crash is not really good advice. And, and if it's being given to you as advice, and it was given to me when I bought my first house, and I'm certainly glad I did not wait, um, I wouldn't follow that. Studies show, this is my own research too, that the best time to buy a house is now. And you cannot really outsave market inflation. 
you might be able to, but it's much more difficult to save more of a down payment to get more house than it is to um, realize market inflation. So if you just got in with a minimum down payment now, your home will go up in value faster than you can save that money tax free. So I really would not advise sitting around and waiting. And this isn't a sales tactic to get people to purchase now. This is just this is just truth. And uh, I've owned eight homes personally, and I've realized variable rates going down. I'm currently at 1.7, which is fantastic. I've also realized a lot of market inflation in those properties. And so I'm taking my own advice. I wouldn't wait for the market to crash. I wouldn't hold your breath. It could, you could win, but it's a gamble. All right. I think this is my last slide. It is. How are we for time? We're doing pretty good, actually. We're we're about two fifty six p.m. We got a couple minutes uh, left till three, and we can probably start the Q and A uh, at any time when you're ready. There, Caleb. Sounds good. Okay, I'll fly through this, um, and you can cut me off if you need to. So, when it comes down to buying a house, you're likely going to see homes in the in the country for cheaper than homes in the city, like an in town. Um, middle unit townhome is roughly 350 to 375 right now in Aurelia. Um, whereas that same price range can get you a half acre lot just outside of town with a detached property. It's going to be considerably older, but there's a reason why. First of all, walk score and drivability. Also, your well and septic versus your city services. So you don't have the advantage of being hooked up to the sewers and, and, and city water. You have your own water source, either dug or a drilled well, and then you're, you have your own sewage system, which would likely be septic. Um, depending on the banks, you know, it's, it's important to make sure that you're buying a house with potable water and a house that has a, um, a good working order septic system. But understanding how these services work is, is beneficial as well, because you don't want to get yourself into trouble or buy a house with a 40 year old septic system that explodes on closing because that's no good either. If you work from home, you're a first timer, you're a millennial, you have a job that offers flexibility for when the weather's bad, or maybe you do work full time from home. Whatever the case is, you're going to need good internet. You're likely going to need full bars on your cell phone. The further you get out of town or there's certain pockets, and this is the importance of working with a local realtor instead of calling agents all over the place is uh, they're gonna know where those pockets are, where you can get cable service to your property or whether you're gonna be on, on satellite. And not that satellite's bad, it's just you should probably get an example of what that service looks like and costs before you decide to make an offer if internet is important to you. If you're just an average or a, 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 an avid Netflix binger, say that five times fast, <laughs> internet's gonna be important to you too. So. Look into that because the service can get a little bit spotty out in the country, even though the properties offer more space and a little bit more attractive. That also means maintenance. That half, half acre lot is not likely to be a push lawnmower. That's a ride on. No one's going to come out there and help you shovel that driveway. No neighborly person in the country is going to walk over and say, can I shovel that for you? You're likely going to need to contract snow plowing services or have a snow blower or a ride on yourself. And just, Again, you'll know yourself and your lifestyle. That's something to consider with these properties. And then taxes and running costs. Oddly, taxes are, well, not oddly, but they are cheaper in, in the country than in the city. There's less amenities and services and schools and tax levies to pay for. So you are going to find cheaper taxes. Um, and the running costs of a rural home versus a city home almost equal each other out. Like you don't have a water and a sewer bill if you're on well and septic. Um, but then again, every four or five years, you're having it pumped for $400 or you're having your well serviced or you have a UV filtration system to upkeep. So I wouldn't say that there's an, any real advantage. Your, your internet will be considerably more expensive outside of the city. So my advice here is not just shopping within your price range. Keeping that at the top of mind is, is obviously important, but shopping for amenities as well and what's going to be important for your lifestyle. So that's really all I have. Um, so thank you if you hung in there. <laughs> I know it was a lot of information, but appreciate your time. Awesome. Thanks so much, Caleb. That was really awesome information there. And it's really good to kind of highlight the fact also that, you know, what types of homes you can get in Aurelia right now for that price range and what types of homes you can get outside of Aurelia or even yeah. outside of Barrie there. I know that the... 
is it the further north you go usually that the homes uh, get a little bit more affordable or how does it work like that? Especially for rural properties. Yeah, we just joke around like that. We say drive till you qualify. Drive till Um, you qualify. (laughs) Because if your pre-approval amount is 300,000, you you likely are looking in Bracebridge. Um, But like just a little bit north of here in Gravenhurst, your in-town properties really aren't that much less expensive. Right on. Well, that's really good. We still have a bunch of people on the call here. I'm sure they got Q&A, some questions. And then thank you very much for holding out till now. I do see some questions there. So we can probably just start with questions. If you can just type any questions you have regarding anything regarding the mortgage section that we covered, anything regarding about uh, the credits and the grants that we covered, as well as questions for Caleb there, uh, questions about real estate, questions about the market. Caleb's really knowledgeable in the really and very market. And, um, and he can also uh, answer those questions. So let me take a look here of the first question. So, okay. First question is, I missed number five on biggest mistakes. What was that question again? All right. And that question is from B. Scott. Thanks, B. Scott. Let me grab that mortgage mistake here. So mortgage mistake number five. And I think I was blasting through those towards the end there just to make sure that we had enough time for all the content. And that is not getting pre-approved. Mistake number five was was not getting pre-approved and start and, and actually starting shopping without um, getting that. And a lot of the times, um, that's that's not a sales tactic. That's that's a practical thing that you could do for yourself. And that is just to make sure that you are prepared. You know what your credit score is. A lot of the time, when we're working on a mortgage file in the office, we'll actually see like the um, perhaps there's something on the credit bureau that someone co-signed for that they totally forgot about, and that could be another car loan or it could be um, another uh, mortgage, perhaps. That recently happened to one of the files we were, like, were working on was someone actually co-signed for their um, uh, niece's mortgage. And now she's trying to get a mortgage and it's affecting her on how she would qualify. So that's the biggest mistake. It presents you with a stronger offer. And you know what, Caleb, I don't know if you've seen this before, but... Um, in one case, someone that was pre-approved through us was able to win out a different offer in competition, even though the other offer was $5,000 less. And, oh, sorry, even though our offer was $5,000 less. So I would like, like I kind of joke around that a pre-approval could be worth 5,000, but I'm not, I don't know if you've seen that in your experience before. Yeah, you mean like the other offer didn't have a pre-approval? Didn't have a pre-approval, but was 5,000 more. Yeah, oh, of course, yeah. Because there's just so much more to it, especially if you have less than 20% down. I've seen CMHC get the file and decline it. And it, you know, that can take a lot longer than five business days. So if you're considerably closer to wrapping up your financing than the next buyer, the difference between a firm offer and a conditional offer can be worth huge bucks. And I've personally taken $9,000 less on a resale unit that my wife and I had. Um, I had two offers to look at. One had no conditions and one had conditions. The one without conditions was $9,000 less. And that's, that's a no brainer in our industry because there's absolute, once you, you're a signature away from a done deal, the other people could have found something on the inspection or they could have not got their financing and then we would have lost the other buyer. So yeah, having a pre-approval or having financing so secure that you don't need a finance condition, you will outbid everybody. Awesome. Yeah, that's really good information. And we can help you if you want to be a person that puts in a firm offer to get you as prepared as you need to be to make that decision. Okay, great. So thanks for that question, BDOT, Scott. Astrid's got another question here. I just wanted to know how much room you have to negotiate in a new build? I really can't answer that question. Uh, Caleb, maybe you can speak to that. Yeah, for sure. So um, 
I had a good chuckle. I work with a lot of builders and years ago, a builder called me and said, Hey, how much did you sell the house for down the street from my new builds? And I gave him the answer and I said, how come you wanted to know? He goes, to be honest, we don't really know how to price our houses. Um, and so we just look at them, the market values and the neighborhood values. And we work from there because, you know, a price per square foot can only take you so far um, because they include um, the lot size and the whether it had well and septic or whether it didn't what the development fees were and builders get tons of rebates too so the, the real answer there is there's not actually a ton of wiggle room if you're buying a spec house where you get to pick your lot and things like that um, they're going to offer incentives like appliance packages or, or things like that but it's extremely rare to get anything off of a brand new build if the house is already built and now the, and it's in the builder's name, so it's a physical property and it's being sold as a resale. No one's ever lived in it, but it's being sold through a real estate agent or through the builder direct, but it is already built and they've picked a price that's negotiable. And that's, that can be treated just like any other resale. You do your homework to see what the, the property value is, but if they haven't dug ground or broke ground yet, it's, it's virtually zero. Okay. Awesome. Astrid, I hope that answers your question. Um, and we'll move on to the next question. Thank you so much for all the questions coming in. I see we got a bunch more to go. So let's just look on to the next one here. It's from Megan. Uh, my husband works full time, but I am a full time student. Do I get, I do get the, uh, can I think Canada, child tax benefit um and i work in the summer but only make about twelve thousand over the summer i have good credit and so does my husband where are we at would i qualify it at all and it sounds like you guys have megan a lot of different income sources and we would be able to combine all of those only certain lenders though would allow us to use those multiple income sources a lot of them prefer like a lot of the bigger banks only prefer employment or business income, but a lot of the other lenders that I work with that provide just as good of interest rates also would take into account the Canada child benefit income, the, the, the tax benefit you're describing. In combination with your part-time income over the summer, we'd have to look into it a little bit more. Um, specifically, the lender would want to know, uh, are your part-time hours guaranteed each week? How many are guaranteed each week? Um, and if you've been there for over two years as a part-time employee, then that would just eliminate a lot of questions. But if you haven't been there two years yet, they will need to make sure how many minimum hours you get per week. Um, but th that with your Canada child tax benefit and your husband's income, you'd be able to afford a house. No problem. I'm not sure how much, because you haven't really put down how much your tax benefit is or your husband's income. But definitely after this call, you will get an email from us and you can schedule a call with Sam and myself and we can take a look at where you are at for your mortgage pre-approval. Okay, great. So thanks for the question, Megan. I hope that answers your question. Okay, Sadat asks, for a new immigrant four years, if we are able to make, I'm guessing you're saying down payment, then does the annual income matter if my income is $20,000 only. The income does matter, actually, unfortunately. Um, if you're making $20,000 a year um, before tax, uh, you will be able to qualify for approximately a $100,000 home today. So uh, it's gonna be a little bit challenging, but if you could add a co-signer, perhaps a friend or a mom, or dad or uncle or aunt, someone until your income goes up, we could get you a house today and then we can remove you, your co-signer later on down the road. But you could get a mortgage. It's just, it won't be for very much. But thanks for your question. Danielle says, my husband works full time and I am a bus driver. I'm off due to COVID-19 and would we qualify? I know COVID-19, it's causing a lot of issues with employment and with people keeping their jobs right now. So with being laid off, sorry to hear that. And to get actual pre-approvals right now, 
the banks are only counting the income that is actively coming in. So if it's, if you're laid off due to COVID, we won't be able to use your income until you're actually got received your first pay stub back to work. If you are on maternity leave or parental leave, in this case, we will be able to use all your income. So if you usually make 75,000 a year and you're off on mat leave, but say you're coming back in four or five months, we can use your full $75,000 a year. I've known people who have bought houses while on maternity leave, no problem. But with COVID, and if you're laid off, you're going to have to wait till you get your first pay stub back. Great question, Danielle. And sorry to hear that. I hope bus drivers return back to work soon. All right. Uh, Mia, is a down payment always necessary? And can you take out a loan for that? Maybe it was mentioned, may it have missed it. Great question, Mia. So there used to be no down payment mortgages. And right now it's a little bit different. To get a down payment, you either have to save it yourself or you can apply for a, um, a down payment assistance program through the County of Simcoe. County of Simcoe actually will provide you with 10% down. So if Caleb finds you a $450,000 home, they'll actually give you $45,000 for that home. And there's your down payment right there. There are some qualifications. You can't make over a certain amount of money, but definitely reach out to us after and we can look into that for you and get you that application started so you can see if you can qualify. All right. So any other questions? All right. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. Thanks, Astrid. Thanks, Adat. Hi guys, this is from Sam. My fiance and I have a very different credit scores. Just wondering how we can optimize our situation we're getting for a pre-approval. All right, awesome. Great question. Uh, this question, I get a lot actually. Say um, husband and wife come in, uh, husband's got a really poor credit score, a lot of missed payments on the credit bureau and wife has really high credit score. Everything's paid on time. There's no debt. It could be switched around too. I'm not meaning to put favoritism on any particular sex there, but uh, it's I'll, in this in this case, the lender will look at the lowest of the two credit scores. So if your spouse's score is so low that it's below the 630 mark, a lot of these times what will happen is the one spouse will buy the home on their own or they'll buy the home with a co-signer only. And then the spouse and the co-signer own the home for say one, two, three years, we'll take a look at your other spouse's credit and advise as to how long it will take to fix the credit and work with them. And ideally we'll be able to get their credit score updated and fixed in about uh, three to six months. Okay. If the, we have another question from Steve Dignard, the down payment from the county. If you don't stay for the 20 years, do you need to return the full amount upon the sale or is it based how long you've stayed in the home? So for the down payment from the county, the way that works is if you don't stay in the home for 20 years, you will have to repay back the original amount plus 10% of any appreciation you've had on your home. So say if you buy your home for 400,000 and they give you $40,000, then they will take, um, and you sold your home for 500,000 and uh, you made 100,000. So the county will take back their original 40 plus 10% of the gain, which would be an extra 10,000. So they'll take back 30,000. So I hope that answers your question. You get to keep all the rest for yourself. Okay. Great question though. Thank you, Mia. Thank you, Sadat. Um, Andrew asks a question here. I'll be getting a new job soon and will be getting paid fully in cash under the table, not taxed. I'll be submitting my hours, but I won't be getting a pay stub. Guessing this doesn't work to get pre-approved since there's no pay stub. It's not. <laughs> Thank you very much for the question, Andrew. I appreciate it. In this case, if you're getting paid this way, then um, we won't be able to get you a mortgage from a bank, but I could connect you with a private mortgage if you like that sort of thing. We'd be able to get you approved that way, no problem. It might be a little bit harder for your, us to stomach the interest rates, but it will be something that 
is available if you want to go that direction. Okay, thank you, Caleb, for attending the seminar. Caleb did have to head out. He is a busy real estate agent. I advise if you have some questions for him, feel free to reach out to us after and we can send them, send you to his way. Okay, so my contact information, I'll send it out after the seminar. I'll also uh, include it in the chat below here. Okay. My email address and cell phone number. And also you'll receive a email from Sam and his cell phone number um, later on as well. Okay. All right, any other questions here before we call it a day? We have been doing questions and answers now for about 15 minutes. A lot of great questions, a lot of great discussion here. I'll just wait for a moment here to see if there's any other questions off our YouTube or Facebook channels. Okay, so one more time. <laughs> no worries, Mia. Don't forget to fill out the scratch card uh, link there to make sure that you do receive your scratch card in the mail. We want to give you a chance to win your down payment. Also, feel free to book an appointment with us as well. And is COVID-19 affecting the real estate market? Great question. And Caleb is actually gone right now. That would be a great question for him. In regards to the mortgage market, though, I can uh, give you that a lot of variable rates have come down for mortgages. So if you're looking to get a variable rate mortgage, it's a great time to do that. Fixed rates have come down slightly. Uh, they could be coming down more this week. We are waiting to find out for sure. And as far as other reasons or other issues and how COVID-19 is affecting the real estate market, um, I'll let Caleb hand handle all, all those questions and that you can reflect, uh, relay those to him later. Thanks very much, everybody. I appreciate you hanging on till the end. I know it's been a wonderful day out there and you could have been able to be out there mowing your lawn, pulling weeds, but instead you're here today. And don't forget to fill out the scratch card. I'm putting it in the chat box below. And if you have any personal questions, uh, there's a way to schedule an appointment with me or Sam directly on that link. And we look forward to speaking with you there. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. I hope you have a great day and wishing you all the best. Bye for now.